Hello, everybody. We are finally back after our little two-week hiatus, little break, what you want to call it. Uh, I last did, on about two weeks ago before the little vacation that I took, I did a video on the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, discussing this, the decision of Japan to surrender. We will have a future video about that on September 2nd, since that is the day that the surrender treaty was actually signed between Japan and the Allied Powers. So, if you did not watch that video, be sure to go back and watch that one. Now, as for today, this will be the only video this week, as it's toward the very last day of the week, of course. And we are finally going to hit a topic that I had kind of mentioned in previous videos throughout this past summer, and I just never really got to it until now. So today we are finally going to cover the very little known war, at least it is very little known if you live in the United States or Great Britain, but if you are a Canadian, you probably very highly know about this war, and that is the War of 1812. Now the War of 1812 was a conflict between the United States and Great Britain. Yes, we went to war with Great Britain twice, if you're American, and this happened between the years of 1812 and 1814. Now, many may ask, why would we, why would the United States, if you're American at least, why would we, why would we want to go back to war with Britain? Were we not independent? Yes, we were, but the, the reason we went to war with Britain was not because of the same reasons that the revolution had spawned. However, some, including those in power at the time, the Repub Democratic Republican Party, or the Republicans, keep in mind this is not the Republicans that we know of today, this is an entirely different political party that is actually the predecessor to the modern Democratic Party. So keep in mind, when I say Republicans, I don't mean today's Republicans. This is a different political party. Both of the modern political parties had not were not formed at that time, at this time in the nation's history. There was the Federalists, and there was the Democratic Republicans, or simply known as the Republicans, and we will explain them here shortly. There was uh, many reasons, and one of the reasons, of course, was br trade. This was one of the major reasons why we went to war with Britain. The war ended in a draw. No side really won, and the biggest losers, you could probably say, was the Native Americans, who lost almost every bit of their land, and it's seen as a last bid gambit to stop American expansion into their lands. Where if you live in any other place in the world, it is viewed differently. So we'll discuss that here at the end. So let's go ahead and start here. So in order to understand the War of 1812, you have to understand what the political climate is in the world at that time between the United States and England and even France to an extent. In the 1790s, France hit the Re French Revolution. It happens in 1789. The 1790s are known as the French Revolutionary Wars as multiple little governments try to take power in France until eventually we get a very famous little short guy named Napoleon Bonaparte, who I'm pretty sure we all know. Napoleon takes power, he becomes the Emperor of France, and then there is a series of wars between France, its allies, and a series of coalition powers, mainly consisting of Russia, Prussia, and Brit Great Britain against Napoleon's France, and these are known as the Napoleonic Wars. Now, let's jump back here to the 1790s. The United States is roughly, we, became, we gained independence in 1783, although we had declared it in 1776. So, we're going to use the 1776 birth date. So, we have been independent by 17, by the 1790s, we have been independent for roughly 20 years. And at this point, this is when the French Revolutionary Wars ha start going on. And during this time, there is a major practice that starts coming into play on the high seas. Britain and France, in particular, try to restrict trade with the other. They try to blockade their ports and try to restrict the amount of trade they're getting. Well, this doesn't just stop at enemy nations. This, start, this also involves neutral countries, such as the United States. And the United States, under George Washington, declared neutrality during the, during the French Revolutionary Wars. However, this did not stop the French nor the British from seizing American ships or preventing them from trading with the other country. And there was also a practice that became known, and this was impressment. Impressment would be a very, and keep in mind what this is, because this is going to play a very important factor as a cause for the War of 1812. Impressment was simply, it was the practice that British naval ships did. Some The French did a little bit as well, but it was mostly the British and the Royal Navy. They would board American vessels, be it military, be it merchant, be it whatever, they would board American vessels, British officers and military would come on board the vessel, and they would seize sailors that they claimed were deserters from the British Royal Navy. 
Now, sometimes, yes, these men were deserters. There were a few that actually were deserters, and they were right to take them back. However, a majority of the time, these men were not deserters, and they were American citizens. Thus, British Britain was technically kidnapping Americans into making them serve into the British Navy, which, of course, it needs men for the Navy because we're at war. And that was Britain's biggest military force was the Royal Navy. So this largely outrages people in the United States, including the United States government. And during the 1790s, politics also began to form. You had the first two political parties forming. You have the Federalists, led by Alexander Hamilton and John Adams, who mainly believe that there needs to be a strong central government that controls m many aspects of the people's life. And then you have the Democratic Republicans, or as we'll call them here, the Republicans. Keep in mind, it's not the same Republicans. And these are led... This faction believes that the states need to have more say in the government. The government doesn't need to be so controlling. And these are led primarily by Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, who had, also, who had helped write the Constitution. Now, during the 1790s, the, Brit the Federalists were the ones in power. And Washington, although he never officially declared that he was affiliated with a political party, in fact, he said that he disdained both of them, he disdained the formation of political sides, he more often than not sided with the Federalists and their policies. So during the 1790s, the Federalists are mainly in power. And then John Adams, of course, he was a Federalist, he was elected as our second president, and thus the Federalist policies can continue through the last years of the 18th century. During the 1790s, the Federalists were very pro-British, while the Democratic Republicans were very pro-French, due to the French alliance during the Revolutionary War, and the Federalists believe that we need to reconcile with Britain and kind of become allies with it. So during the 1790s, with the Federalists in power, there was a lot of pro-British trade policies that were put up to try to appease it. And in during the 1790s, I think about 1794, you had something called the Jay Treaty that was signed. And this was signed with Great Britain to protect American maritime trade during this war. However... Although the treaty was indeed ratified by the U.S. Senate, as all treaties must be, it was never extremely popular with the poem population. Many people, common citizens, weren't very supportive of this treaty. They called it an outrage. They didn't like it because they thought it was unfair. It was bowing to Britain. We had just won a war of independence from it, and now we're bowing to them. So this leads to, in 1801, John, among other things, as we also mentioned, like the Alien Sedition Acts in another video, um, in 1801, John Adams loses his re-election bid. The Federalists are knocked from power, and the Democratic Republicans take over the government when Thomas Jefferson is elected as the third president of the United States in 1801. And thus, this helps to set the country more on toward not only a pro-French leaning, but it also sets it on a leaning of what's going to come to the War of 1812, as the Republicans are very anti-British. They're very anti-British. They still remember the revolution heavily, and they had this sort of anglophobia. They don't trust them. Hold on a second. I'm going to drink a little water. This might be a while. All right. So... After the Democratic Republicans, or Republicans as we'll call them now, after the Republicans take office in 1801 with Jefferson's election and they gain majorities in the House and Senate, relations between the United States and Great Britain very quickly, in, over time, they start to sour, they start to go bad, they deteriorate. But at the same time, so are those with France as Napoleon becomes more and more of a dictator to his people. Britain then begins to blockade French ports after 1805, after Napoleon's victory at Austerlitz. Now, Napoleon responds to this by he issues what he calls the Berlin Decree in 1806, and this establishes his continental system. Now, what was the continental system? The continental system was, it was imposed by Napoleon. It basically infringed on any neutral trade, including that of the U.S., since the U.S. is a neutral nation, by it designates that any ship visiting any British port would be deemed an enemy vessel. So if an American merchant is going sailing to Britain to trade some cotton, for instance, I'm cotton or what's another one here, some farming goods, let's say some corn, he, if he stops in Britain, and the French find out, and they will find out, because they would know the ship's log or something like that. You're supposed to record where it goes. 
The French would deem that merchant ship was an enemy vessel because it visited Britain. It was giving supplies to their enemies. Britain soon responds to this, and it issues what they call the Orders in Council in 1807, and this requires that any neutral ship of any neutral nation has to obtain their licenses in England before trading with France or its colonies. This, the Orders in Council becomes one of the largest complaints against Great Britain in the United States in the early 1800s prior to the War of 1812. This is a big leader up to that. They did not like the idea that Britain is basically trying to monopolize the merchant trade by requiring that we must buy our licenses in there. France follows this statement by Britain by issuing what, they, what Napoleon calls the Milan Decree. And this basically authorized the capture of any neutral vessel that was had submitted to a British search. If the British were searching you, well, guess what? Now we can capture you because you're still an enemy. The Americans, however, through, although both the British and the French were both guilty of implementing things that were kind of making it hard for neutral nations to trade, they grow much more angry with the British due to A, there's Anglophobia still in the United States from the Revolution, B, the Republicans are in power, and C, there is the impressment issue, which of, by this time, the French are not practicing impressment. It is mainly the British, and this angers the U.S. immensely. So although they were angry at both Britain and France, Britain by far got much more ire and anger toward it than France did. A major flashpoint comes in 1807. And in 1807, off the U.S. coast, another violation that um, British vessels were doing was, according to the terms or so of l international law, I forget how many miles it is, I think it's between 6 and 10 miles, I think it's 10 maybe, 10, 10 miles, I think, out from a nation's coastline is considered territorial waters, I think. I could be wrong in the mileage, but it's a couple miles. It's not more than 10. And British... Thus, any let's say it's ten miles out. If you are within ten mile, if you're closer to shore to the American coast, closer to tw ten miles, or not in international waters, you are in American waters, and it's supposed to be that enemy so vessels of another nation, unless they have permission, are not supposed to be there. At least military ones are. Merchant ones can. However, Britain had a very bad practice ever since the days of the Revolution that it kind of ignored this rule in the case of the United States, and it would send its warships sailing in the Atlantic Ocean definitely within the American coastal territorial waters. This would also anger Americans. And during the impressment issue, it only helped them to impress more Amer to help do this, the British be able to do this more because they're constantly coming in contact with American ships. In 1807, the British frigate HMS Leopard is sailing off the American coast and it fires, it encounters the U.S. Navy frigate Chesapeake. And it, supposedly there are three or four, I forget how many it was here, hold on. There are supposedly four British deserters on the ship. So the Leopard signals the Chesapeake that I need to board. I'm boarding you. The Chesapeake refuses the board. The leopard opens fire, disabling the American vessel, which then strikes its colors and allows the British ship to board. They then get on the British aboard the Chesapeake. They take the four sailors, of which only one of them was actually a British deserter. The other three were U.S. citizens. And this enrages the American public far more because now not only is British still, Britain still doing impressment, now they're opening fire on our ships to do it. They're killing Americans, and there was a couple Americans killed. London did not apologize immediately for this. The United Kingdom, or Great Britain as we'll call it, did not apologize immediately for the incident. And this brought forward the very first suggestions by the American population and the government that we could have a war against Britain. Now, President Jefferson... Although he was very anti-British, he didn't exactly specify that he wanted to go to a war. So he tries to wrangle Britain in and put in Britain and France in diplomatically. And when that fails, he decides the way we're going to wage war on Britain and France is economically. Brit Jefferson and the Democratic Republicans fought for some odd reason that the United States economy was so important and so strong at that time that if we refused to trade 
with Britain and France, it would call cause them to come crawling back to the negotiating table. They would be hurt if we didn't trade with them. When actually, it was actually quite the opposite. We would be hurt if we didn't trade with them because we were such a young nation at that time. We really didn't have a major economy, not like nowadays. If the United States wanted to really hurt a nation to stop trading with them, they would, yeah, they come crawling back now. But back then, that was not the case. So in December of 1807, Jefferson encourages Congress to issue and pass the Embargo Act. And the Embargo Act forbade all exportation of U.S. goods from the United States ports, and it banned any imports that coming from Britain. Now, the act, as we kind of mentioned, although it's supposed to bring Britain in, it kind of backfires. It causes the U.S. to get hurt much more than it was hurting Britain. It drives up shipping rates. It also hurts the U.S. economy by depriving merchants of a lot of their revenue. And thus, there's a lot of people that become very angry at the law and they want it repealed. So thus, because of this, just before Jefferson left office in March of 1809, it was repealed by Congress. However, it was not entirely forgotten with as although Congress repealed the Embargo Act, in its place they put the Non-Intercourse Act, which don't think anything funny by the name. I know some people got very perverted minds. I don't know why they called it this, but bear with me. And it, this act, the Non-Intercourse Act, was created, which forbid trade with only Britain and France. You could trade with any other nation in Europe, but you could not trade with Britain or France. Basically, what was going on here, it's mostly hovering around trade. The United States declares because it's a neutral nation, it should have the right, even during war, to trade peacefully with any nation that it chooses where Britain and France are trying to restrict the trade with the other, and this comes in conflict with the neutral trade because they're getting in ca caught in the net, too. In 1810, this law is replaced, and not intercourse is replaced by McCone's Bill, and this resumes all the trade between Britain and France. However, it contains one little thing. It contains a promise that if either Britain or France would automatically drop all the commercial restrictions on the United with Amer for American traders, for American merchants, if they would drop the restrictions on American trade, if either country, whichever one was the first to do so, the United States would automatically reinstate non-intercourse on the other nation. Well, of course, one of them takes this to full granted, and that is none other than Napoleon. Napoleon automatically sees that he can maybe put a rift between the United States and Great Britain. He can maybe cause them to ha cause Britain a distraction. And thus, he automatically, once he gets word, he plays this off and he offers to exempt the United States from the Berlin and Milan decrees in August. And this is in 1810. Britain protests after Napoleon does this. They, its diplomats go to the United States, its ambassadors, and they tell you, Napoleon's lying to you, which he was. He never actually lifted them. Napoleon never did actually lift the restrictions, even though he said that he would. But regardless of this, we didn't listen to the British, and President Madison decided that he took Napoleon at his word, which he shouldn't have because he lied, and he reinstated non-intercourse with Britain in November of 1810. So this really sets the stage in the trade part, but there was another smaller part that was also becoming a major concern between the United States and Great Britain, and that was the Indian raids on the frontier in the Old Northwest, which was the Northwest Territory, which consisted of what is now presently the states of Michigan, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, a bit of part of Minnesota, and Ohio. Ohio was actually a state at that time. Yay, my home state. I love my home state. I really do. I love Ohio. Anyway, <laughs> Britain... How do we start this here? I'm looking here. Indian raids were occurring quite frequently in the Northwest Ter Old Northwest Territory, and including even in Ohio, even though it was still a state. Indians had feared since the American Revolution that American expansion westward was going to mean the loss of their lands, and that they, inc and because of this, they increasingly allied with the British, who were still up north in their colony of Canada. Yes, Canada was a British colony. It's going to play essential here to the war. In 1811, the Shawnee leader Tecumseh, who you may have heard of, he creates an Indian confederacy that is consisted of many united tribes who wish to resist American settlers in their lands. 
Now, Tecumseh, he gathers tribes, and during 1811, he is away, and he has his followers, and his, his brother is also with him, his younger brother, who is known as the Prophet. I'm not even going to try to pronounce his Native American name, because I can't even try to pronounce it. It's a very odd-looking name, so if you want to try to pronounce it look it up, go ahead and look it up. But anyway, he creates a little settlement at Prop, what becomes known as Prophetstown in what is now in Indiana Territory, in modern-day Indiana. Well, in December of 1811, Tecumseh goes away. He goes down south to try to recruit more tribes into his confederacy. His brother is left with the in Native Americans or Indians, whichever one you want to say here. I'm going to try to use Native American. He, he leaves him up here, up there at Prophetstown to guard the settlement. Well, at that time, governor of the Indiana Territory, William Henry Harrison, he had already come to blows with Tecumseh once, almost gotten in a fight with him. Because he was trying to push him out and put all the Native Americans on reservation, and they were refusing to. He sees this as an opportunity. He goes in with some troops, attacks the Native Americans at Prophetstown, and burns the settlement to the ground in eight, December of 1811. And what becomes known as the Battle of Tippecanoe, given the fact that it took place on the Tippecanoe River. The, after this, after the Battle of Tippecanoe, this really heights the war anxiety as it becomes... Not only do the Indians fear that the British were the only ones that could help them, but it also becomes clear to the United States that the Native Americans are gaining weapons, they're gaining horses, they're gaining a bunch of things that aren't tip that are European made, and it becomes very clear that they're believing that the British, although not entirely all true, although somewhat true, they believe that the British are arming the Native Americans and actively encouraging them to resist the U.S. settlement. Thus, they're tr still trying to enroach on the expansion of the United States westward. Because of this, Americans in the United States here begin developing a very distinct idea. They believe that since the British are likely the problem, if we get rid of the British, we get rid of the Native American problem. Well, they come to one conclusion. We need to kick the British from Canada. Let's get them out of Canada. Then they won't be here on the continent and they can't interfere. Now, Britain and the inhabitants, inhabitants of Canada also start fearing the U.S. because they start realizing that the U.S. also has not only that they're blaming them for the Native American raids and everything else, but they do realize the U.S., there are expansionists in the U.S. who would love nothing more, and they have openly stated they would love to annex Canada. They would love to add it to the United States. And they become very fearful that the United States will try to take Canada by military, by military means, and they will use the Indian unrest as a war pretext, which they basically do. Now, President Madison soon begins to agree with war hawks in Congress, which are led by senators such as Henry, well, representatives such as Henry Clay of Kentucky and John C. Calhoun of South Carolina. And he begins to agree with them that war with England was probably it was becoming inevitable and that it might actually gain benefits for the United States, such as a reaffirmation of American independence, that we are an independent nation, that Britain needs to respect us and respect our rights. In November of 1811, Congress was called into a, into a session and Clay was elected Speaker of the House of Representatives, which puts the War Hawks mainly in charge of Congress. Keep in mind, the War Hawks were mainly Republicans. They were not usually Federalists. The Federalists were very much against the war, usually. On June 1, 1812, Madison officially sent a message to Congress, and he asked it to declare war on Great Britain, mainly over two issues that he cites. He cites the Orders in Council issue, he, and he cites impressment. And on June 18, this becomes signed. Congress declared war by the, the most divided vote margin it ever it has ever done in a war. So in order to declare war, Congress has to officially vote in order to declare it. The president can ask, but Congress is the only one that can actually declare war. And because of this, there had to be a vote. Now, every other war in history the United States has gone to that there was a vote in, the vote has been pretty solid to our leaning yes or no. There's been a very high majority. This one was the only one that was kind of very much divided, where in the House you had a 79 to 49 vote, and in the Senate you had a 19 to 13 vote. 
keep in mind, you might like, well, where's 50? Well, keep in mind, we don't have 50 states back then. We have Louisiana became a state in 1812, so we would have 18 states. Now, the Federalists very much opposed the war. They viewed it as a Republican power play. They thought that the Republicans are only willing to go to war because they think that if we they win, the United States wins the war, it will support them in the upcoming elections. It will gain them support. In New England, it also is very unpopular. And this also includes a lot of where a lot of the Federalists are from. And New England is very unpopular because the New Englanders, they primarily re rely upon, even to this day, they rely upon the sea for their trade. And a war would no doubt cause a major British blockade of the American coast and cease trade with other nations as we're at war. And this would hurt New, New England merchants who were trying to make their living and fishers. And this was very much true because the United States, may I add here, that the United States has decided to go to war against Great Britain for a second time or a second war of independence, as they somewhat called it. But there's a major problem, and it comes in the fact that the United States is not in any way prepared for a war. There were uh, there were, had been a slight increase to the army. There had been a slight increase to coastal defenses and fortifications, but there really wasn't a massive thing. For here's the here's the numbers. For example, what we have when we decide to go to war, the, the the U.S. Navy only has 20 ships. The Royal Navy of England has over 1,000. The U.S. has roughly a 7,000 man army of regular soldiers. Britain has around 5,200 soldiers in Canada. Due to the War of Napoleon, Britain's forces in Canada were largely diminished as it was too busy trying to fight Napoleon in Europe. It didn't have many resources it could spare. So that's why many became to believe, well, we're not going to beat the British at the sea. Why don't we try to take Canada and we can whip them there? It's underdefended. It should be relatively easy. Many of them actually believed that we could literally just march into Canada without a shot and we would win. That was not the case. The big advantage the United States had was in militia, but keep in mind, militia is basically just handing a random person a gun and telling them to go up to the firing line and shoot. They were not trained soldiers. And the United States has around 458,463 militia at the beginning of the war, while in Canada, the British mainly have, out of Canadian militia, they have around 4,000. The U.S. also has a detachment of around 3,049 United States Rangers, which are, I don't, at the time, were a different kind of uh, classification of soldier. And just for an example here, how worse it's going to get, by the end of the war, the United States had jumped up to a 35,800-man soldier army, and that's by 1814. But by 1814, Britain goes from having only 5,200 soldiers in Canada to, to having almost 49,000. So you can see there's going to be a major thing com coming as the war drags on. Now, New Englander, as we mentioned, New, New Englanders were very opposed to this trade. They didn't support it to the war. Thus, they didn't think it was okay. Now, Madison, the Republicans, and citizens in the South and West were very much for the war, as they believe it will largely support and benefit them. Now, before we go on here, oh, I better add this too. Now, Britain saw the Declaration as kind of a, just a little minor distraction. They were too busy fighting Napoleon in Europe that they couldn't really afford to send reinforcements to Canada. Thus, they kind of saw it as a distraction. And truth be told here, the sad thing is, Britain had officially agreed to end the Orders in Council in 1812, two days before the United States declared war. However, this news did not reach the U.S. until August. Had it done so, it's very likely we would never have declared war. Because back then, you had to, sail, you had to send a letter across the, on a big ship across the sea. You couldn't just air, air mail it or send it in an email. You couldn't do that. Now, due to this shortage of British men, the British governor of Upper Canada, General Isaac Brock is his name, he is given orders to defend the Canadian territories at any cost with the forces that he currently had, that he would not be getting reinforcements from England at this time. Now, Brock has to take this into consideration because he only has 5,200 soldiers and 4,000 militia, so he has around, let's say, about 10,000 that he's got to use. And the U.S. is 
almost immediately it organizes an invasion of Canada and begins planning to take in annex Canada. And it even believes that they won't face any kind of resistance because many of the Canadian population had either been had been not been born in Britain. They had been born in Canada or they had even been born in the United States and immigrated up there. And thus it was popularly believed that as the American armies invaded Canada, that the Canadian colonists would citizens would be more than happy. They'd rise up and join with the Americans and they'd be free, be happy in that they were free from British tyranny. Just the opposite happened. Unlike us, the Canadians were very loyal to Britain. They saw no reason to want to break away. They didn't trust the U.S. Thus, the Canadians actually kind of termed this as the first time that they actually came together as a unified people. Because keep in mind, you have French Canadians, you have British Canadians. Now, before we go further, I want to show some pictures here. We got some pictures. And I, part of the reason I waited um, so long for this video was I went to a War of 1812 fort here in Ohio, which we're going to mention here in our video. And I do have some photos I'm going to show of it that I took in person. This was about three weeks ago. And I will discuss that here in, toward the end. Let's get a couple. These are probably appropriate. No? So is this one. So right here we have James Madison, who was our fourth president. He took office in 1809. He would remain in office until 1817 after the war had ended. He was a very fairly good president. He was also our shortest president. He was only like five foot, five, only a little more than five feet. He was very short. Here we have William Henry Harrison, who was the governor of the Indiana Territory and a will be a general during this war. And fun factor, this guy later becomes the ninth president of the United States. However, he has the shortest term of any president as he dies only a month after taking office in 1841 due to him catching pneumonia. And here we have a portrait of the Shawnee Native American leader Tecumseh, who had created his Indian Confederation, and when the war broke out, he immediately sided with the British and helped them in many of their campaigns, as we're going to see here very shortly. And here we have a portrait of Isaac Brock, the main British general of Upper Canada and governor of Upper Canada at the very beginning of the war. He is kind of revered as a hero in Canada. If you are a Canadian, you probably know this guy. Now let's continue. So what happens is U.S. leaders, due to their invasion of Canada, they're kind of overly optimistic because they want to take Canada, but they don't realize, well, you kind of got an army that sucks, and it's largely untrained. So this probably is not as good as you think it is, and it's not. So they're kind of over-optimistic, and in late summer, Michigan Territory Governor William Hall he leads an invasion force into Canada from Detroit. He crosses the Detroit, I think the Tro Detroit River, I think that's what it's called. I forget what it's called. Darn it. What is it called? I think that's the name of the river. And he crosses into Canada, into Ontario, and he is soon repulsed back by Edward Brock. Well, not Edward. Isaac Brock. That's a different Brock. Ugh. He's repulsed back by Isaac Brock, who comes in with his troops and repulses the Americans back across the border. And Brock had, had rece was receiving assistance at this point. He was fighting alongside Tecumseh and a large portion of his Indian army. On August 16th, Hall even surrenders Detroit after he had crossed back onto the American side. He surrenders Detroit, which was a fort at that time, not a city like it is now, without even firing a shot. Why? Because he believed Brock outnumbers him, when in reality he didn't. Out of misguided information that he'd been given, he surrenders the fort without firing a shot. Real smart, Hall. Real smart. Even Brock had found it kind of disgraceful that he did this. So, the war's barely begun, and we've already lost Detroit. We've basically lost the Michigan Territory. Brock soon moves to Lake Erie's eastern end in September of 1812, where another American invasion force is preparing across the Niagara River, led by General Stephen von Rennesler. 
On October 13th, the Americans crossed the Niagara River into Canada, and they engaged the British at Queenston Heights. Although the Americans do lose this battle, the British do win and push them back across the Niagara River. Isaac Brock is unfortunately for the British, he is killed in this engagement. And the Americans, although they are forced back, they just rob Britain of a major part of its leadership, military leadership in Canada. General Henry Dearborn of the United States Army was also hoping to launch an, Canadian, an invasion of Canada up to take Montreal. However, when he got to, he was basing this in New England with his new army from New England, and when they got to the Canadian border, his militia refused to cross across the U.S.-Canadian border because many in New England were against the war, thus that he refused to take part in it if it was not on U.S. soil. With Brock gone, the British leadership now takes a hit in Canada. During the fall of 1812 and into 1813, though, due to Brock's earlier victory in Detroit, now that the British have Detroit and they have most of the Michigan Territory, the and they control the Great Lakes, the Indian raids and British incursions start being launched from Canada, and they start going throughout the Northwest Territories, and these may, being met, led mainly by Tecumseh and the one of the new British major generals, whose name was Henry Proctor. That's going to bring us to where my home state gets involved here. My home state was a battleground here. And I don't know if you're from Ohio. If you are, you live in a battleground state at that time. Ohio was the furthest west other than Kentucky and Tennessee. Uh, the Northwest Territory was the only state made. So in 1813, it proves to be a slightly more successful year, at least in the Western theater, the Ohio-Michigan theater. Following William Hall's surrender of Detroit in August of 1812, General William Henry Harrison is placed in command of the U.S. forces in the Northwest Territory and in the state of Ohio. Harrison, as we mentioned, looked like this at the time. In February, Harrison and his army, they begin constructing a new fort along the Maumee River, and this becomes known as Fort Meigs. I think I'm pronouncing it right. I could be wrong in the pronunciation. Fort Meigs is built on the Maumee River in what is not today the settlement, uh, in what is today the town slash city of Perrysburg, Ohio. It's just south of Toledo. And this is actually where I went. So I will show you some photos here at the very end of the video of that site. And I know what happened here. So, learning of the growing American forces that were occurring, as he gets, Proctor gets word that Harrison is building a fort in northwestern Ohio. He learns of this building of Fort Meigs, and he comes to the conclusion that if Harrison is allowed to amass his forces there, he could lead another invasion that could retake Detroit. So, Proctor and Tecumseh despise that they will lay siege to the fort and hopefully take it, and maybe they can invade and take Ohio. So, in April, on April 28, 1813, they launch a siege of Fort Meigs. Proctor sails across Lake Erie. He lands at the mouth of the Maumee River, and then he meets up with Tecumseh, and they go sail up the river until they get to the fort. And this happens on April 28, 1813. Now, despite there was being, despite heavy British artillery bombardment of the fort from across the river, the Americans were able to mainly resist this because they built earthworks within the fort that were able to protect the soldiers. They could dive and duck behind them. So, unfortunately for the British, the artillery bombardment doesn't work. And there's even a devastating India attack on the Americans when the American reinforcements come up from southern Ohio, led by... Uh, General Green Clay, he goes across the river, tries to knock out the British guns, even though he'd been told that there were British reinforcements on the way. He goes across, knocks them out, and here come the British and Indian reinforcements, and basically slaughter almost all of his little regiment. However, d even despite this, Harrison and his troops hold Fort Meigs, and on May 9th, the British let up the siege, and they withdraw. Afterward, Harrison leaves the fort in command of General Green Clay, and he, he then readies his troops for the upcoming expedition that will retake Detroit. Tecumseh convinces Proctor that he needs to try to take Fort Meigs one more time, and he convinces him to do so, and a second siege is launched in July of 1813. 
The Indians and they didn't the British did not bring along artillery though this time. And because of this, they were kind of restricting what they do. So Tecumseh came with the idea that well, I'll have my Native American warriors. We will stage up a little mock battle, a fake battle, outside the fort and try to lure the Americans out. Well, this doesn't work because of one reason. The Americans know that there are no American reinforcements supposed to be even be coming. Thus, they don't fall for the trick. They know that someone is probably trying to play them. When the Americans don't come out, Proctor decides it's a failure. He doesn't even try to besiege the fort. So Fort Meigs is saved. This is, however, may I add here that he decides that he goes back from he will there will be no further incursions in Ohio. But on his way back to Canada, just before after the second siege ends, Proctor makes one little dash, little last desperate bid to try to attack and take a po post in Ohio, and he attacks Fort Stevenson on the Sandusky River further to the west, which is where present-day Fremont, Ohio is now. And unfortunately, this doesn't go well either. Even though he was over, even though he outnumbered the number of Americans inside the fort, he still failed to take it, thus he retreats fully back to Canada. This is the last British incursion into the state of Ohio. On September 10th, this really changes, because, keep in mind, Proctor had used Lake Erie as his way to get to Ohio, and the British controlled all the Great Lakes. Well, as we mentioned, and as we had a whole other video devoted on this topic, so I'm not really going to do nothing here on it, I will provide you that, vid that video here at the very end of the recommendation, that way you can go see it if you have not seen it on the Battle of Lake Erie, that took place on September 10th of 1830. 13, just off South Bass Island here in Ohio, which is basically the settlement of Putin Bay. And on September 10th of 1813, an American naval squadron led by Oliver Hazard Perry captured the British naval squadron of Captain Robert Barkley, and thus they take the Americans have gained control of Lake Erie. The British are divided in the Great Lakes because in order to get to Lake from Lake Huron to Lake Ontario, you gotta go to Lake Erie. And it's under American control. This also stops the incursions in Ohio. The victory gives the United States control of the lake. And it allows Harrison to retake Detroit soon after. So now we've regained Detroit. Now what do we do? Now we move to Canada. And October, on October 5th, Harrison's army invades Ontario, the province of Ontario, Canada. And they engage Proctor and Tecumseh's army at the Battle of the Thames. And... and just across on the northern end of Lake Erie, and Tecumseh is actually killed at the Battle of the Thames, and this causes his Indian Confederation to not only shatter, but it also ends the Anglo-Indian alliance that had formed. The Indians kind of no longer ally with the British, but Tecumseh gone. He, his, their leadership is now gone and dead. In the East, things were not as successful. We've successfully invaded Canada. We've taken, retaken Detroit. We've successfully invaded Canada in the West. We've defeated them at the Thames, on the Thames River in Ontario, Canada. However, fortunately, in the East, and by East I mean like the Vermont, New York border with Canada, things don't go very well at all. It goes just the opposite. The West is very successful. The East, not so much. In the east, you got another problem. And late, let's see here, there were multiple invasion attempts at Canada made from the east, but none of these were able to succeed. In late 1813, the U.S. forces evacuated the Niagara Peninsula as the British kind of closed in on them. However, they during the evacuation of the peninsula, they burned the Canadian village of Newark, and this ticks the British off. In response, British troops then go along the New York, northern New York Canadian frontier, with the border between New York and Canada, and they start burning and ravaging towns and American villages there, including the young village of Buffalo, New York. This kind of puts so yeah, Buffalo has been burned once if you're from Buffalo. So it's been burned once. So, and at the same time, the Americans had gone, and the most significant action they did in 1813 in the east was they did sail across Lake Ontario and did lay siege to Fort York, which is modern-day Toronto, 
and that was actually the capital of Upper Canada at that time. And the Americans did, for a brief time, take the town, but they suffered many casualties. There was a massive magazine explosion there that was set off by the British to prevent the Americans from getting the powder. That devastated a lot of them. And the Americans didn't stay long, but they did burn the town a little bit. And this had also incited the British, and this was going to come back to haunt the Americans about a year later. On the high seas, there isn't really much of a war. Although there have been single small victories gained by individual U.S. frigates against individual British frigates early in the war, the American frigates were soon, this, these little string of victories was ended as the Royal Navy starts instructing its ships to no longer engage the Americans individually, but they are to avoid individual engagements and, engagements, and instead they are to blockade the American coast and its ports. By January of 1814, the British blockade was extended all the way from New England to Georgia. This was why New England had feared it. It was all the way from New England to Georgia, and it starts crippling American imports. In March, Andrew Jackson, start, he actually defeats a war against the Creek Indians in Alabama, in the Alabama Territory, or well, Mississippi Territory, Alabama was part of it, and there's a couple of new generals here before we go further. There's a couple of new generals that become very prominent in 1814, American generals that start actually being able to draw some successes. And that is Andrew Jackson, who I know I've done a series on. And you, if you've watched any of the other ones, you can go back and look, who became our seventh president. He's on the 20 hour bill. You had Andrew Jackson, you had Jacob Brown, and Winfield Scott, all become from this war. Brown, he crossed the Niagara River in the spring, and he captured British Fort Erie during the summer. And this was across in, around the Niagara Peninsula in Canada. And then Scott, if I remember right... Oh yes, when Brit now British troops advanced a counterattack after the Americans took Fort Erie, and... Instead, the Americans were able to successfully defend their number on July 5th at the Battle of Chippewa when General Scott successfully repulsed them. Now, the tables soon very much turned against the United States, and that's because of one major factor. Napoleon in 1814 was defeated for the first time and exiled to Elba, the island of Elba. He would return in 1815 for 100 days, but the main Napoleonic Wars are now over. Britain is no longer fighting France. They no longer have to pin all their forces in Europe, and thus Britain starts sending battle-hardened British regular soldiers to Canada to quell with the American invasions. Now things start going bad. It, the British invade New York, plan to invade New York in the fall of 1814. However, on September 11th of 1814, when they attempt this on Lake Champlain, between the Ver on the Vermont and New York state border, they are defeated at the Battle of Plattsburgh Bay, and this causes their whole New York invasion to be cast off. However, their invasion to the south in the Chesapeake Bay area is about to become the one that's notorious. In August of 1814, British forces under General Robert Ross landed outside of Washington, D.C., from the Chesapeake Bay, and their target is actually the city of Baltimore, Maryland. However, they see Washington, D.C. as an opportunity to tr try to avenge the American burning and everything else that they had done to Fort York, the capital of Upper Canada the year prior. They know that Washington, D.C. is the capital of the United States, even though it's a very small city at that time, and they deem that it's a worthy target just to humiliate the United States. Not to capture it and end the war, but to hum humiliate it. And in the Chesapeake Bay, you have successful British raids that are going on by the British Royal Navy fleet there, led by Admiral Alexander Cochran. On August 24th, Ross and his army routed American militia at the Battle of Bladensburg. And this happens in Maryland, just north Washington, D.C., and in response to this, they start marching to Washington, D.C. The U.S. government, including President Madison, flee to the countryside in Virginia, and Dolly Madison, the president's wife, 
actually is still in the White House, and she's trying to tell them to get everything out of there that they can to save what they can. She even has the portrait of George Washington, of him standing up. It's a Gilbert Stewart portrait that is hanging in the White House to this day. She has it taken and removed from its frame, has the canvas rolled up and taken out of there. She saved that painting. The British, they arrive in Washington, D.C., and when they arrive, they set fire to the government buildings, including to the White House. There is a reason why the White House is painted white, and part of the reason is because if we didn't paint it white, you would see the scorch marks on the shell of the original building. The only thing the British didn't plan, didn't burn, was private homes. And, and fun fact here, when the British got to the White House, they actually, there was a state dinner prepared. President Madison was supposed to be having a state dinner that night, and it was sitting on the table. The British soldier, the British army helped themselves to the meal, and then they burned the place down. At least they didn't waste the food. Now, the Americans were embarrassed by this. However, as we mentioned, the British said that this was justified because of what the Americans had done to Fort York. And in a way, I'm not going to say the British were wrong. Ross and Admiral Cochrane, after Washington, D.C. is burnt, they subsequently launch a combined army-slash-naval siege to take the city of Baltimore, which was heavily fortified and is a very big key to that taking that region. Ross, however, fails with his attack, with his army, with his land army on September 12th. And this, he attacks at North Point, and he's actually killed in this engagement. So the guy that ordered Washington, D.C. to be burned, he's dead. Yay! Cochrane, with his admiral, with the admiral, he leads his naval fleet to b enter Baltimore Harbor, but in at the entrance of Baltimore Harbor, you had a very large defensive fort known as Fort McHenry. So on the night of September 13th to 14th, the British are bombarding this fort from the sea with everything that they possibly have. And you might think right now, well, this sounds familiar. Where have I heard of that fort before? Well, you might have heard about it from school, because this actually has a very significant part in our nation's history. The next morning, the British had failed to oust the Americans from Fort McHenry, and the next morning, the Americans raised a very large American flag over the fort, and this lets Cochrane know that he has failed, and he abandons the siege of Baltimore. So Baltimore is saved. Now, where have you heard this? This is very much related, and this is where we get our national anthem from, the Star Spangled Banner. A young, I think, I'm trying to think what he was here, I don't remember, of a lawyer or a doctor, one of the two, I forget which, I think it was a lawyer. But Francis Scott Key is the author of the Star Spangled Banner. He, I think, was a lawyer, and it hit, I, I could be wrong in his occupation. Anyway, he was sent by the Americans to negotiate with the British out in Baltimore Harbor for the release of a medical doctor that was American that they had captured, and he was actually, the doctor was a friend of Key's, and he had gone to the ship, he had negotiated a release, and they had successfully struck a deal. However, the British knew they were getting ready to bombard Fort McHenry, and they ordered that the Americans stay on board the ship only for the night. That's all they requested, that we will let you go in the morning, we're going to keep you here overnight because we're about to bombard the fort. So the entire time, Key is actually watching from the British vessel, and he's watching throughout the night of the British bombarding Fort McHenry, he's seeing the bombs bursting in air as he puts in the poem, or the rockets with red in their red glare. So it's describing the battle that he saw. And throughout the night, he could see when the bombs would burst or when the rockets were going by, he could see the American flag of the fort still waving in the little bursts of light that kept protruding around it. And in the morning, when, he, when the all smoke had cleared, he, when he had seen the American flag being raised, he was beyond relief and he was beyond joy and he was so happy that after he, him and his friend, the doctor, had gotten off the British vessel, they had actually, when he got home, and I think it actually might have been when he was walking in Baltimore, he started kind of writing down on a piece of scrap paper this little poem. And eventually in the 19, in the 1900s, it was adopted as our official, well, official national anthem. Of course, we only use the first verse. So the they failed to take Baltimore, and this is really the last major 
campaign prior to the end of the war. In December of 1814, though, this is not known for sure, and the Federalists in New England are very much against the war still. They've got, they gather at the Hartford Convention in Connecticut to try to discuss ways to redress their grievances to the government. Many New Englanders are against the war. It's hurting them now. They can't stand it anymore. They want to get out of it. And at one point, some of the states even consider secession, breaking away, like the South did in the American Civil War. However, this Although this is briefly considered and it never actually happens, the this kind of makes the rest of the country question New England's patriotism and the Federalist loyalty to the point that the Federalist Party goes extinct within another 10 years due to this. With it, with the war now at a stalemate after the loss after the British failed to take Baltimore, the both sides kind of realize that the causes of the war are gone. The orders in council had been repealed, and with Napoleon defeated, the impressment issue was gone. Britain had no need to have to kidnap American, American sailors for its navy anymore. They were not at war with Napoleon anymore. Thus, and the British armies, although they're powerful, many of them have been at war for over 10 years with Napoleon. They just want to go home. And the United States, it's starting to lose the war now, and it's starting to deem maybe it might, if we can make a peace and come to a peaceful term where we don't lose nothing, that might be just as much, just good of a result as winning the war. So in August of 1814, shortly after the burning of Washington, D.C. and the failure of the Britain to take Baltimore, both sides begin peace talks in the city of Ghent, which at that time was, I think, part of France, but in today that is now in Belgium. Now, the British had hoped that they were going to get a decisive victory and that they could use this to kind of mold the negotiations to their image. However, this victory never really came, and this caused them to make the quick peace so quickly after Baltimore. The U.S. had dropped demands to end impressment entirely, and Britain, due to the fact that it was no longer being practiced, and Britain had dropped demands that it had had for, an in, for the creation of an Indian border state between the U.S. and in Canada, and also it dropped any demands that it had for any Canadian boundary changes. So what did they come to? On December 24th, 1814, Christmas Eve, the both sides sign the Treaty of Ghent, and this ends the war with conditions returning to the way they had been prior, basically a draw. No one loses anything, no one gains anything. Whatever the condition, whatever your land and territorial conditions were before the war, that's what they are now. No one gains anything, no one loses anything. However, although we're although the war is now officially over, this like the same problem that started the war, the news took a while to get home. So since this is right before New Year's Day of 1815, no one in the United States knows the war's over. Not until late January. And this causes one last battle to be fought technically after peace had been declared. Due to the unawareness, British forces had been amassing an invasion of New Orleans, of Louisiana, which was a U.S. state at that time, the newest. And British forces were sent there under, under General Edward Packenham, and they attacked New Orleans on January 8th of 1815. However, they were defeated by Andrew Jackson and his army at the Battle of New Orleans. Peace news finally came in late January, and, in con and Congress officially ratified the Treaty of Ghent in February. Now, due to the factor that the war had not only been a draw, but then you technically had won what was essentially the last battle of the war, the Americans had won the Battle of New Orleans, although the war was technically a draw, Americans came out of the war feeling that they had somehow won it, that we had defended our rights, that we had forced Britain to give us respect, that we had won in some way. So although we had no objective, no original objective had actually been achieved in the war, for some odd reason, the United States came off and the American people as a whole came off from this feeling that they had won, even though they really hadn't. In Great Britain, the war was very quickly basically forgotten due to the fact that it was over kind of sh overshadowed by the larger war that Britain had just won against Napoleon in Europe. However, the two groups that remember it the most are the Native Americans and the Canadians. 
In the Native Americans' case, this was their last chance, really, to try to save their lands, at least any lands that were east of the Mississippi, and they lost it. And immediately after, most of the Native Americans remaining in Ohio and the Northwest were put under reservations, and eventually, as we discussed in the Indian Removal Act video of about a couple months ago, they were forced west of the Mississippi. And for the Canadians, Canada, if you go to Canada today, it's very highly looked upon. It's very highly remembered because this is, although Canada didn't become a united or autonomous country until 1867, it was really, the War of 1812 is what many Canadians consider to be the first time that their people became kind of unified in a cause, and this was to resist U.S. invasion. And Thus, this kind of paved the way for the United Canada that would eventually emerge. So for Canadians, the war does loom large as the first time they really came together as a Canadian people to defend themselves. So that is basically the War of 1812. Now we'll look at the rest of our photos here and of the Fort Meigs one. Look here. Let me go through the historical paintings, I should say, first. Oh, boy. oh, yeah, we have a map to the drew. Here we have an image of the British trying to retake Fort Erie along in Niagara in Canada. The Ni Niagara Peninsula in Canada. And this was in 1814 in August. The Americans did hold the fort, and they didn't withdraw until it became feasible that it really, it was, it was, they were wasting more men defending the fort than they needed to, and eventually they chose to withdraw regardless. But in this attempt, they did push the British back, and they did hold the fort. Here we have a little picture of the British burning Washington, D.C. when they entered the city, including the White House. And then right here, make sure I'm good here. Here we have a map that I've drawn to kind of demonstrate where certain things occurred. His, this is a map of the United States at the time of the War of 1812, between 1812 and 1814. So let's look at this map. Here you have the Atlantic Ocean. Spain owned Florida at that time. Mississippi and Alabama are part of the Mississippi Territory. Yeah, Illinois was a territory, Indiana was a territory, it was in its present day shape, and Michigan was a territory. So, what do we have here? I kind of have drawn out the major things. We have the United States and everything else, some couple cities, but the stars indicate where you had a battle. Now, up here you have Canada, and mostly what you're looking at is right here is like where the battle is. Right here was the Thames, in 1813, this big red dot right here in Lake Erie, you had Put in Bay, right here off Ohio. French town, Detroit, right here. You had Fort Meigs, where I actually went, right there in Ohio. Fort Stevenson, where Fremont is now. That was their battle there. So you had a lot. This was the Western Theater over here in the Northwest Territory. And then over here, you had the Eastern Theater near Lake Ontario, where you had like Lundy's Lane, Fort Erie, Queenston. Over here, we had Fort York. Montreal was up here, but nothing ever happened. Pl Plattsburgh up here on Lake Champlain. He had all, the main focus of the war was mainly around the U.S.-Canadian border, especially here on the Great Lakes. Then you go down here, and the British had, had their little campaign and attacked Baltimore and Washington, D.C. in 1814. Right there as that is. He went in here. And of course, off the shore, you had the British naval blockade, this big old line with the ships that I've kind of doodled. It extended from New England down to Georgia. And then in 1815, not knowing the war was over, we did have the little invasion. And of course, the British did blockade down here in the Gulf of Mexico, too. They did have the two little battles near New Orleans when the British tried to invade there. That failed. So it's just a little battle map I drew just to kind of help out. Maybe So, I have some photos here that I took at Fort Meigs, 
when I went, I could still be pronouncing it wrong. I do apologize if I do. But we'll show a couple. This was built by William Henry Harrison and his army during February of 1813. It was attacked twice by the British with a siege in early May and a siege in late July. The British failed to take it bo both times. It is now in Perrysburg, Ohio. I will provide here, I will give you in the description to this video, I will provide you the link to their website if you should have any interest in going there yourself. I highly recommend it if you can. It was very it was very historical experience to take. There's an inside museum where you can go see individual artifacts inside, and then the reconstructed fort on the side of the original is outside. And at first you think it's tiny, but when you get to it, it's like, wow, this th this thing's massive. I'm not kidding you. And it's actually right across the river from where the 1794 Battle of Fallen Timbers had taken place, which you can also go see that battle site. And from the site of an old British fort that used to be there, although now it's just the, all that remains is the earthworks and it's part of a public park that you can walk through. So anyway, I'll show you some photos here that I took that day. Yep. Start here. This was the grand battery, the cannons, at the fort that they had reconstructed. This is on the site of the original. The original fort is gone. There are a couple of the original earthworks, and in fact, I have a picture of the longest remaining original earthworks still in the fort the, that they dug to try to resist the British artillery that was coming at them. The rest of it is reconstructed. This was the grand battery that they had facing, looking out toward across the river where the British were. That one. Uh, let's see. We also have right here's a memorial kind of uh, obelisk, you might want to call it, dedicated to Fort Meigs with Fort Meigs of 1813 on it. On the bottom, if you look very closely, this thing. Oh, I kid you not. This thing's massive. Uh, let's see here. Ah, blockhouse. Now, the blockhouses, there was a couple blockhouses on the fort, and they were outposts to help with the fort's defense. This is the view of an outside of one here. This one, you can actually go inside in the upper floor, too. And as you notice, there's little holes up here. What would be, there would be a cannon down in here. There was a big cannon down here, an opening to fire the cannon. Now, on the first floor, there's, you have your cannon. Up here, there would be soldiers stationed out who would aim their rifles out these little holes and could fire. And the cool thing about these little holes is they were narrow on the outside, but they got bigger as you came in. Thus, you could look through them and see your target, but the like the British, for instance, they would have a hard time hitting you because it's so narrow on the outside. So that's a blockhouse here at the fort that they've rebuilt. Right here is an inside view of one of these blockhouses. Uh, this is the second floor where the soldiers would have been stationed, and this is what you put your gun out of, and you'd fire. And they were painted white because, especially on the first floor, they couldn't actually light a gas lamp because you had loaded gunpowder down there. You had gunpowder upstairs, you had cannonballs downstairs, you really didn't want to be lighting a fuse. So they painted it white so that at night it would be the brightest it possibly could so that they possibly wouldn't have to light nothing. Then here we have an item of discipline. This was called the wooden horse. And this I'm going to explain this what this is here in a second, but I ought to show you the photo. So the wooden horse was used to discipline soldiers back in 1812. As the United States Army was the only one in the world that it was illegal, you could not take the lash or the whip to your soldiers, like you could in Britain or France. It was forbidden to do so. Thus to discipline them, you had to do other things. And this was what they called the wooden horse. Now, in the wooden horse, what they would commonly do was they would take a soldier who maybe, let's say, he'd been caught of, he was a traitor, he had been stealing, he'd been disobeying his officer, let's say any of the three of those things. He, they would put him on top of this, his leg, one leg to each side, so this is riding up your crotch, and they would chain two small cannonballs, one on each ankle, to your ankles, and this would weigh you down on this, and they'd make you sit on this for a couple hours. Maybe even in a couple of days if you're not if you're that unlucky if it was serious enough, and I think you can get the picture if this is riding up your crotch and you're a guy, it's probably not going to feel too good, especially after a couple hours. 
So this was probably highly effective. <laughs> Here we have a picture of, as I stated, there were original earthworks. Now, the original earthworks were like 14 foot high in the fort. However, due to erosion and over time, many of them are either gone or they've become much smaller than their original size. Now, they have some reconstructed earthwork at the fort, but this one overgrown by weeds is actually an original 1813 earthwork that had been dug. It's one of the few things remaining of the original fort. This was dug by Harrison's army, this big old long Earthwork I do see the side they want forever. This is the entire length of the fort. You can see it on the side by the weeds. This earthwork runs the entire length of that fort, and it's one of the only original remaining earthworks they have. Of course, it's not 14 foot now. It has eroded away quite a bit, but they, they still have it there. The only thing is you cannot climb on it just to try to limit the amount of erosion taking place. But this was awfully cool to see an original 1813 earthwork that was dug dug up to kind of protect the soldiers from the British artillery fire that was coming from across the river. Then finally, I just have an image here of the inside of the fort. Just kind of give you a sense of scale how big this inside is. It's massive. I kid you not, it is massive. It is a massive fort. This is just part of it. So anyway, I thought I wanted to share those. So that concludes our little video here on the War of 1812. It's definitely kind of a forgotten war, but it's also kind of a short little war to kind of discuss and very eventful. So that concludes that for this video. I hope I covered most of everything. I might have missed one or two things. If not, I will provide some other sources here at the end of the video so that you can go well, at least one other video that you can check out that I know covers it pretty well. I will also provide the thing here for the Battle of Lake Erie video, which was that one battle that I did an individual video on back in May. So I will provide you a video for that. So that way you can look at that. So I will definitely provide both of them, both so you can get on both of them. And in the description of, to this video, in the description, I will provide the link to the Fort Meg's website if you have any interest in going. I highly suggest going if you can. So definitely, definitely go if you can. It is definitely, it's worth going. It's only like 10 bucks admission. So it's not that bad. And the, what you're, from what you're getting, you're getting like a two hour experience. It's very informative and it's very cool to see. So I would highly recommend it. So I will provide the link to their website in the description down below. So that concludes for today's video. I don't know what our next one's going to be yet, so I guess we'll find out when that comes out. So if anyone has any ideas, be get, to, get them to me now if you've got any. <laughs> if not, I'll be picking it. So that concludes for today. So as, if you like this video, or if you like any of the other videos, be sure to like, be sure to comment, be sure to subscribe to the channel. If you are enjoying these videos, definitely be sure to subscribe to the channel to support it. Thus, as we always, we try to just simply teach history. That is just our, my main goal here. So if I'm doing it in any way, I'm very happy that I'm doing it. So that's all for today. We will get to the, another video sometime next week. And again, if you have any questions or anything, put that in the comment section down below, and I'll be more than happy to answer it if I can. So that is all. Have a good rest of your weekend, and God bless you all.